go for it. Okay, let's get started. Another announcement. So Thursday we have our quiz over the lower limb. As soon as that is done, we have Dr. Carlson, orthopedic trauma surgeon, who's gonna come in and take us through a couple procedures and just show us how that the anatomy relates to what he does in and out. And, uh, so make sure when you finish your quiz, you don't disappear off into study land. You wanna stick by and um, <laughs> make sure that you, you get to benefit from Dr. Carlson's amazing amount of experience and knowledge. Okay. All right, so lower limb, we're almost through it. Two more. So last time we finished up the posterior compartment, correct? Do we all remember? <laughs> yeah, okay. So we move on to the lateral compartment. And nice part of the, uh, about the leg is it's fairly simple when it gets to the lateral and anterior compartments. So There's not as much going on as some of the other compartments, so that's nice. We just have two muscles that we need to know, the fibularis longus and the fibularis brevis. <clears throat> These both originate on the um, <coughs> lateral fibula. Fibularis longus attaches higher up, obviously, than the fibularis brevis. And then they wrap in down around the lateral malleolus underneath that and attach to the lateral and uh, plantar sides of the foot. So we go to trace their uh, tendons down. The fibularis brevis attaches to the lateral portion of the foot, some of the, the lateral metatarsal there, of metatarsal five. And then the fibularis longus continues on across the plantar surface of the foot to attach to metatarsal one and the medial cun cuneiform, which is one of our tarsal bones, one of those cuboidal tarsal bones. <coughs> Do you remember what, uh, what nerve innervates the lateral compartment? Mm -hmm. Superficial fibular nerve. Good. So uh, remember that is a branch off of the common fibular nerve. So remember the common fibular nerve coming down through the popliteal fossa, wrapping around the head of the fib fibula and then splitting into two nerves. So we have the superficial fibular nerve coming down and innervating the lateral compartment and the deep fibular nerve, which continues on around to the anterior compartment. Okay. That's the innervation. Arterial supply, we have perforated branches of the fibular artery Remember the fibular artery, artery branches off the popliteal artery when the popliteal artery becomes the tibial artery. So the branching back between those two and uh, comes in and produces branches that come in and um, supply the fibular artery. Wow, those words did not come easily. <laughs> okay, so, sorry. It goes into the anterior compartment, yeah. Okay, so that's all there is to the anterior, or the lateral compartment. Yes? Um, in the notes, it says uh, the lateral sural nerve is also in there. Is that mm, yes, I forgot to put that slide in. So silly of me. So yes, yeah, so we, that's another cutaneal. So remember we talked about the sural nerve coming down the cutaneous part of the posterior leg. The lateral is just kind of a branch that comes around to the lateral side. Okay. I forgot to put that, that in. Branch, Sorry? It branches off of the, uh oh, I'm blanking. Tibial nerve, I think. I'm having a blank here. Ah. Tibial nerve. Mm hmm. Yep, tibial nerve. Okay, wow. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? You're good. All right, so that's the lateral compartment. The anterior compartment, we have uh, four major muscles we want to know. The tibialis anterior, 
It attaches to the um, lateral and anterior surface of the um, tibial, one of the tibial condyles, and then comes down and what is that noise? Okay. <laughs> Gas us all or something? Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, whatever. <laughs> okay, uh, and then it uh, attaches here to the inferior surface of the medial cuneiform and metatarsal one. So it comes down, wraps around that, that joint, the region between the tarsal and metatarsal bones on the lateral side, so medial side of the foot. So that's tibialis anterior. Mm -hmm. And that is going to do what? Foot dorsiflexion, right? Mm -hmm. Also helps with inversion of the foot, too. Um, we have the extensor hallucis longus, the extensor digitorum longus, those two. Um, work to extend the digits, right? So, um, since you're hallucis longus, remember the, the big toe is also termed the hallux, so hallucis would be hallux. <coughs> mm -hmm. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, these also, also participate in uh, some foot dorsiflexion as well. And then finally, the fibular is tertius, which uh, also helps with uh, foot dorsiflexion. Hmm. The insertions and origins are in the notes. I don't particularly need to go over those in detail with you guys. Um, I thought this was helpful, this, this showing the insertion or the origin points on the tibia and fibula, kind of help you remember which re region of the tibia and fibula are the, the sites of attachment for those muscles. And these are all uh, innervated by the <coughs> deep fibular nerve, right? Um, one note, the deep fibular nerve also is known as the perineal, or yeah, how am I going to remember how to say it? Good grief. Peroneal. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so peroneal. Okay, cool. Because I was looking at the word and I was like, um, right. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. So that's another name for this this deep fibular nerve. And I bring that up because um, we have an image that has those names in it later on. And we taught, we were taught that. We were taught that. Right. Right, yeah, so I think they're, they're switching over to these fibular names, but it's not complete yet, so it's good to be aware of them. Thank you. Okay. All right, so then arterial supply and innervation. So we've got the um, deep fibular nerve here, as we were talking about, for the, um, wow, my words are not coming today, innervation. And then for the uh, arterial supply, we have the anterior tibial artery that supplies. And remember, it comes, <clears throat> excuse me, perforates through that aperture in the interosseous membrane. So it's a branch off of the um, popliteal artery that then comes in and through that, that interosseous membrane to come to the um, anterior compartment of the leg. That's all there is to that. It's pretty simple. Okay. All right, so then we have a couple of, of questions about what happens when we damage them. So here's where we have the peroneal nerves coming in. So these are the same as the fibular nerves here. And so when we have damage to them, then we obviously lose the ability to uh, contract the muscles in the anterior and lateral compartments, which is going to reduce the ability to dorsiflex. So, impairing dorsiflex, and this is what we call foot drop. So, people walking have a kind of just a more characteristic dragging of the toe in, in relation to uh, 
the ground and as opposed to a normal a normal walk when they would be elevating the toe a little bit. So it's a good one to be aware of. Foot drop. Um, it can be damaged to any of the fibular nerves, so the common fibular nerve or the deep or, or superficial uh, fibular nerves. Um, the common, damage to the common fibular nerve, remember, often occurs when you have fractures of the head of the fibula since it wraps around that bone. And um, that would then damage the innervation to both the lateral and anterior compartments. Damage to just one of them would result in something that looks more like an inability to invert or evert the foot a little bit more, um, as well as some, some impairment in the dorsiflexion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. So damage to just the deep fibular nerve or just the, the superficial fibular nerve um, would result in some impairment in dorsiflexion, but it would show up more as like an in inability to invert or evert the foot because of the differences in those muscles' actions, those two compartments. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay. All right, so then um, another one that's um, something that we should talk about when we're, we're talking about the different compartments is compartment syndrome. This can happen both in the lower limb and the upper limb. And remember we've got these compartments that are bounded by thick bands, thick, very strong bands of fascia. And so compartment syndrome occurs when there is restriction of blood flow to an, a compartment typically because of either a restrictive bandage, so a cast that's too tight or a bandage that's too tight, cutting off that, that uh, blood flow, or through excessive swelling that actually compresses those, those arteries. So here we've got them kind of embedded in these, um, these compartments, and when there's just a lot of swelling in the compartments, um, the fascia does, yeah, limits the amount of swelling that can happen. And so if it just keeps on swelling, it can compress those, um, those arteries and nerves and end up causing a lot of pain, massively painful, and also um, causes the muscle tissue to become ischemic and eventually die <laughs> if it's not taken care of. Okay. Some potential causes of it would be injuries, acute injuries to the leg, so crush injuries, fractures, uh, anything that will cause extra swelling. Um, and it's, it's almost like the body just freaks out and goes overboard in the swelling and just doesn't really stop. Um, and then also it can be caused by, like I said, restrictive bandages. There's also a chronic form of compartment syndrome that um, is really kind of vague in what's causing it. It's predominantly idiopathic. So it just happens and they got to figure out what to do with it. Um, and so one of the main things that they do is for, obviously to remove a restrictive bandage, but to do a fasciotomy when there's not a restrictive bandage, when there's extra swelling. And basically that's just going in and making these huge incisions in the fascia to allow that swelling to expand beyond those compartmental bounds of the fascia. Um, so then they, they loosely suture the, the incision, so it kind of helps contain it a little bit, but allows the, that muscle tissue to continue swelling, and instead of becoming compressed and ischemic, it can go through the process of swelling, recovering, and healing. Um, and then they'll, they'll close those, those uh, incisions afterwards. Um, those incisions are often very, very large because the entire compartment is, is um, involved. So there was one image I saw where the, the incision on the arm was from the wrist all the way to the elbow in this big W pattern. It just basically laid the entire uh, limb open. But to, to allow that swelling to continue um, instead of causing um, muscle death. If, if the tissue does die, then they have to go out and excise all of that so it doesn't become necrotic and cause problems in there. So, compartment syndrome. Pretty crazy.
All right, so then we've been looking at all these compartments and muscles and nerves and, and how they're all, their action and all that. So we should be able to go back to this diagram and say, okay, we've got these different myotomes. What muscles and nerves would be predominantly involved in these? Okay, so let's, let's take a look at that. So we'll start off with uh, foot plantar flexion. So that's going to be which, which compartment? Posterior. Posterior of the leg, okay. What's the major nerve? Remember? Okay, it is a it is a sciatic, but it turns into another name when we get that past the tibial nerve. Yeah, tibial nerve. Okay, and then what muscles are going to be some of the main ones that that cause this? Soleus, mm -hmm. gastrocnemius. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah, so those are so a bunch of them. This, by the way, would be really good test questions. Really good test questions. Okay, so, so. you want us to know that this one is to uh, do the uh, plantar flexion and like the rest of the, you want us to know that specifically? No, I, I want you to know tibial nerve, what's the major muscles. So if I say, okay, we've got a some sort of damage to the, the uh, myotome that controls knee flexion. What's the muscles involved? What is the nerve involved? Okay. So knee flexion would be which compartment? Posterior thigh. Mm -hmm. What nerve? Sciatic. Good. And what are some of the muscles that are in that? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Semimembranosis. Yep. Good. So use use this as a as a help to help you guys study that out. Okay. All right. So that is the leg. Any questions about the leg before we forge ahead? All right. So then we'll move on to the foot. Um, there are a few bones I want you to know the names of. Most of them we're not going to worry about. There are just a few that are important to know. So we've, we talked to, uh, during the overview section about the metatarsals and the phalanges. And these are the long bones of the foot. Uh, I'll just point out that the phalanges in toes two through five, there are three, distal, middle, and proximal. In the great toe, though, we only have distal and proximal. Just a reminder of that. Working backwards into the tarsals, there's just a few that I want you to be aware of. I want you to know the medial cuneiform. And that is because, as we've already seen, there's been quite a bit of uh, tendon attachment to that, that particular bone. So probably be aware of it anyways. Uh, obviously the calcaneus, another important tendon and ligament attachment site, and also produces quite a lot, or it serves as quite a lot of a weight bearing type bone because it's underneath that whole part of, uh, heel part of the foot. And then finally the talus, which is the main ankle bone that articulates with the tibia and fibula. This is that main articulating surface there. Okay. So that's, that is, those are the bones that I'd like you to know for the foot by name. The rest of them you can be like, phalanges, it's a tarsal, whatever. <laughs> okay. So I just, here's a lateral view of it. So here's the talus again. You can see the articulating surfaces here. And then uh, you can see the calcaneus here providing quite a lot of that uh, support weight bearing structure there on the on the posterior portion of the foot. <coughs> okay.
Oh, that's why I have it here. Okay, two more bones that we should be aware of. Sesamoid bones here on the plantar surface of metatarsal one. And in general, sesamoid bones are small, rounded bones that are embedded in a tendon. Okay, that is their claim to fame. We've already looked at one sesamoid bone, the patella. So that's also a sesamoid bone. They typically occur where there is a lot of tendon movement over a joint surface. So that would make sense with the patella. There's lots of movement in that surface. Also at that metatarsal phalanges joint between, between that um, proximal phalanx and the metatarsal on, on the great toe quite a lot of movement there. So that sesamoid bone helps reduce the friction over the edges of those, of those bones of the joint. <coughs> okay. So important to be aware of sesamoid bones. All right, so then if we look at the surfaces of the foot that are in contact with the, the substrate that we're walking on. So like I said, the calcaneus, large degree of weight bearing there. Also that uh, metatarsal phalangeal joint there, lots of weight bearing there. And on the lateral portion of the foot there. Remember we have our medial arch here. Wow, I can't spell today. that uh, raises that medial portion of the foot up and provides some shock absorption and elastic rebound for when we're locomoting. And then obviously the toes are in contact with the substrate as well. Okay. All right, so those are the major structures that we want to know the foot, at least the bony structures. We do need to talk about adduction and abduction of the digits because there's a slightly different definition of these than we have been looking at. So instead of moving away from the body or towards the body, these are all moving away from or towards digit two. This is the same in the hand as well as in the foot. So abduction would be moving away from digit two. Adduction would be moving towards digit two. And digit two, it just has to be laterally or medially displaced. It, it doesn't adduct or abduct because everything is in relation to it. Okay. All right, so some common acquired anatomical deformities of the foot. And this is, um, one place where the sesamoid bo bones become important. So you can have hallux valgus here, and this is basically the um, first metatarsal bone moves laterally here, and then the proximal um, phalange, phalanx and the rest of the phalanges after it move laterally in comparison. So it's like that that um, metatarsal phalanx joint moves out away from the rest of the foot. This often causes displacement of the sesamoid bones or in relation to that joint as well. So this would be called hallux valgus here. Uh, we also have things called bunions. So this would be bunions are inflamed bursa. So remember, bursa um, typically develop anywhere there's lots of, of motion between the um, ligaments or tendons and overlying structures. And since we've got a lot of motion there, typically we have bunions um, developing on the foot. Often the hallux valgus and bunion can, uh, are confused amongst lay people. They'll, they'll consider this a, a bunion even though a bunion can form on that site, um, there's a difference between that and the hallux valgus. And then finally, corns are just thickened skin, hardened skin, kind of like a callus. And a lot of these occur when um, foot's forced into 
poor foot wear. So things that squish the toes together or not quite large enough for the foot um, can cause a lot of these problems. Hmm? All right, so, well, yeah, so question. Can you explain that one more time? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so it's it's the um, this joint between the metatarsal and the phalange, that first phalange, that proximal phalange, actually moves out this way. So you have lateral displacement of the first metatarsal and medial displacement of the phalanges of the toe. Yeah. What about the opposite? What did I say? It's medial of the joint and lateral of the phalange. Yeah, that. <laughs> what did I say? <laughs> Okay, lateral displacement of the phalanges, medial displacement of that first metatarsal and that, that joint between the phalanges and the metatarsal. Okay. So normally the toe would run straight like this, right? Instead we've got this increased angle there. Okay, any other questions? All right, so main bones that I want you to know of the ankle. So like I said before, the talus is an important one. That's that main articulating joint or bone. Um, the lateral and medial malleolus are also very important. Um, these are, are attachment sites for ligaments of the, of the ankle joint. And then obviously the calcaneus, which you can't see on this. All right, so we have um, several ligaments of the, of the ankle joint. There's a whole slew of them here on this si uh, medial side of the joint, but we'll just group them together as the medial ligament of the ankle joint. These are super strong, so they're very strong ligaments. So typically these ligaments are not strained. Um, they, they're very infrequently injured. Um, typically, it's more likely to have um, an avulsion fracture, so the actual the bone pulling away with the ligament rather than having these ligaments strained. So they're super, super strong. On the other side, however, we have three ligaments that are very commonly injured. So lateral ankle ligament. Um, injuries are quite common. So you do need to know these ones. We have the calcaneofibular ligament, attaches for the lateral malleolus and the calcaneus there. We have the posterior talofibular ligament, which inserts on the medial surface of the lateral malleolus and then to the posterior surface of the talus and then the anterior fib talofibular ligament between the anterior surface of the lateral medialis mele malleolus oof, and the anterior lateral portion of the talus this is actually the weakest of the ligaments in the ankle And some people say it's the weakest ligament in the body, but I hesitate to generalize that far. Right, um, wait a minute. I thought I had an image there. I thought I had a, a is, what is the word? I don't. Uh, what happened? No. Anyways, there's a book, an uh, image in your book that I was going to include. Uh, it just shows a posterior uh, figure 6.98b. That just shows the uh, position of the posterior talofibular ligament better than this image does. How did I put it in there? Whatever. Uh, 
Okay, so we have some common injuries of the ankle. So, like I said, the anterior talofibular ligament is one of the most commonly injured ligaments in the body. So, rolling your ankle, typically that is the ligament that gets, gets strained, especially rolling it, um, so inverting it more than it, it should be, um, often, very often torn or strained. And then we have this more complex injury, what we call the POTS fracture or dislocation of the ankle. And this happens when you have um, eversion of the foot coupled with force into that lateral portion of the, of the ankle joint. And there's several things that are associated with it. So uh, we do get an avulsion fracture. So avulsion fracture of the medial malleolus. So like I said, these these ligaments here are so strong, they're not likely to strain. It's more likely they'll just rip that part of the bone off of the medial malleolus, causing that avulsion fracture. We also have fracture of the fibula, typically, as that, pressures, that, that pressure is pushing laterally. And then um, the tibiofibular ligament is often torn as well. So that is the POTS fracture slash dislocation. Wow, I blazed through that. It was supposed to take a lot longer. <laughs> Any questions about the ankle? Make sense? Yeah. Uh, what was the, um, you said it was uh, inversion of the foot plus another force that caused Yeah, force into the lateral, port, lateral ankle, so. Rotation of the of the ankle this way, and then force into that portion of the leg. Yep. Any other questions? Okay. Well, that's it for today then.